from my Austin backyard. Um, uh, it's actually, uh, when I last measured the sky, it was border late in my backyard, thanks to Apple moving in. Um, they seem to enjoy lighting up the skies. Uh, so uh, as Don mentioned, I'm, I'm a firm believer in the Friends of the Night Sky, and I'll definitely be join, joining that to uh, uh, you know, be able to speak to uh, what the dark skies can actually do uh, you know, for astrophotographers and just uh, people in general. Um, so again, my name is Byron Miller. Uh, I've been doing astrophotography in my backyard for a while now, but seriously, since COVID hit, um, it's been the perfect hobby to uh, just uh, sit down, um, have the time to learn it uh, and get really good at it, um, uh, you know, with uh, everyone being at home and stuff like that. Um, so I'm hoping uh, I can introduce some of y'all to this hobby, uh, answer some of your questions. I'll warn you, it will be like drinking from the fire hydrant. Um, there's just a kind of a ton of information uh, and I'm gonna try and keep it as simple as possible. Uh, give some foundational stuff up front, um, just so uh, as, we, as we progress through, we'll be able to uh, make sense of uh, everything that's going on. Uh, so again, uh, you know, this is Andromeda. This was taken uh, on a 120 millimeter scope that I have in a Sprit 120 with a color camera in my backyard using a light pollution filter. Um, and again, I'll, I'll dive more into that here in a little bit. So the disclaimer, um, you know, I have to say it's fun, it's addicting, um, uh, but uh, I'll joke around that, uh, you know, warn your family and friends and especially your significant others, uh, hey, I'm getting into astronomy. <laughs> you might not see me uh, very often. Um, uh, you know, I thought it was just me at front first, but as I've uh, talked with people on the internet and met some of the great community people uh, doing things virtually, uh, it's almost universal. You just kind of get hooked. Uh, and it's not just at the nighttime either. There's a lot of things that you learn during the day and you can experiment with during the day. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I find it just uh, fun, addictive, educational, uh, the things you learn, everything from a telescope, uh, aperture to lens to cameras to uh, f-stop, uh, focal length and speed and how all of that relates back to astrophotography. It's uh, a lot to consume, but uh, there's ways to uh, get started small and, and work up with your knowledge. Uh, you know, as an introduction, this is kind of just, uh, I tried to break it down and uh, how to get started, what you need to know to get started, um, tips for imaging. Um, I primarily do deep space uh, uh, imaging myself, um, but I threw in some bits about how to do uh, planetary observing uh, and planetary imaging, and then also um, uh, terrestrial, uh, like the pictures you see of people that do like mountains with the uh, Milky Way backdrop and things like that. Um, I wanted to bring that up because that's actually one of the most common places that people start, um, you know, using cell phones or the DSLR to try and get the Milky Way in the background of where they're camping or hiking, things like that. Um, so that's just kind of the overview. Uh, a lot of this um, wouldn't make sense without some basic terminology. Um, you know, in astrophotography, there's uh, a few things that uh, I'll just mention uh, left and right uh, as I explain and talk about these different uh, words and how they're used. Um, this is just a slide to kind of uh, go over it, but uh, I'll progress through and actually go into a little more detail. Um, you know. Uh, several of the imaging types that everybody uses, uh, broadband and narrowband. Um, and then within those uh, imaging types, um, you choose to focus on wide field or what we call deep field um, imaging. Um, and that's kind of like, uh, you know, whether or not you want to do wide nebula or huge galaxies like M31, or if you want to target distant galaxies, clusters, uh, star clusters, uh, there's different uh, different ways to image those, and then different telescopes that are used for imaging those. Um, then calibration frames, I just wanted to mention that and spell it out, and I'll show some examples. Um, you can't talk about astrophotography without calibration frames, and um, we'll show how that is uh, part of the process here in just a minute. And if at any time you have questions, I'll keep my eye on the chat, but otherwise you can open up and uh, just ask a question at any time. I'll be more than happy to take a minute to answer anything as it comes up. So 
So broadband imaging is your classic color imaging um, uh, with color cameras. It's just straight up uh, with no filter uh, or with a light pollution filter. Um, a light pollution filter actually is a piece of glass that will um, help eliminate sodium transmission lines, which used to be the most common light pollution um, uh, transmission that cities had, but a lot of them are moving to broadband LED. Uh, so some of them help cut out some of the LED spectrum uh, to help uh, let you image in your backyard. But, but otherwise, um, broadband imaging is with a color, one shot color camera. Or if you choose to use a mono camera, uh, you have to run LRGB filters, which is uh, L stands for luminance and then uh, red, green, and blue. Uh, so a, an OSC camera has what they call a Bayer matrix on it so that it can pick up color uh, through RGGB um, automatically. Um, but you can also use your one-shot color cameras for uh, narrowband. Um, we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, narrowband imaging um, is kind of the secret sauce to backyard imaging, especially in high boreal skies. Uh, but, uh, you know, much of Austin is at least Bordel 6, um, Bordel 8, and uh, White Zone uh, if you're anywhere near downtown. And you probably have to go about 20 miles outside of the sea limits to see 5 and 4. Uh, I think our observing field that we have as the club is in a 4. Um, and it, it's pretty awesome to see what a Bordel 4 sky is in comparison. Uh, but narrowband is, um, is a filter. Um, uh, hydrogen alpha, uh, sodium, and then oxygen three. Um, you can run the filters uh, by themselves, which they call the SHO uh, filter combination. Uh, or uh, if you use a color camera, such as an OSC um, or a DSLR, you can put a filter in front of those uh, that they're called a tri, dual, or quad band filter that uh, will let you take these narrow band images. Uh, narrow band is the same grace of backyard photography simply because the filters only let through these transmission lines and uh, the transmission lines make up uh, you know, the abundant uh, materials in our universe. So uh, as you can see, the, you know, that galaxy right there, the blue is uh, the uh, oxygen, O3, and the red uh, pinks, um, that's the hydrogen alpha. Uh, so that's uh, that image could actually be taken from your backyard uh, with the appropriate uh, camera filter combination. Wide field, um, you know, that other image I just showed was wide field. Um, this one um, is part of the heart and soul nebula. Um, it's, let me back up, uh, it is huge. Uh, I have an APS-C camera right now, and as you can see, with a 545 millimeter focal length and the large format camera, larger format camera, I couldn't even fit the whole thing uh, in my field of view. Uh, so that's you know hundreds of light years across uh, from left to right. Um, so you need um, wide uh, telescopes uh, to be able to uh, capture these things. And I'll dive more into what a wide telescope actually means here in a little bit. Uh, deep field is the opposite. Um, it's technically not the term. I think, uh, you know, the Hubble calls deep field, they're ultra deep field, but it's the same kind of, uh, same kind of uh, process behind it. Um, deep field imaging would be you're focusing on the extremely long focal length, um, very narrow field of view and uh, more magnification. So you might be shooting for galaxy clusters, um, uh, galaxies individually or small planetary nebula and things like that. Um, super popular. Um, there's what we call galaxy season, which is early spring when there's just an abundance of galaxies out there. So uh, in the industry, a lot of people that even shoot wide field will remove their reducers and uh, switch their camera gear to uh, you know, a longer focal length uh, to be able to capture uh, the cool galaxies that come in. This is just a representation of what you would see with a short and long focal length. And this is just through a single scope. So this is my Esprit 120 reducer and then without a focal reducer. So you can see if you had something like the 360 uh, focal length, you would be able to capture um, 
not just the Orion Nebula, but the, all of the nebulosity and stars around it. So uh, the focal length is what describes how wide you can get. And then, uh, you know, the, the learning curve of astrophotography compared to any other photography out there is what we call calibration frames. Uh, with a telescope, there's uh, optical aberrations on it. Um, there's uh, noise on your camera, whether it's a DSLR, uh, an AstroCam, a cooled AstroCam, or CCD. Um, and then uh, there's uh, dust. Uh, there's also the actual mechanics of the telescope, um, whether your focuser is big enough for the aperture size, uh, whether or not your camera connection to the telescope uh, is wide enough. So you end up uh, with the vignette um, dust motes and the sensor noise and sensor dark current that you have to calibrate out of your frames because uh, when you shoot dark uh, images at nighttime, there's not enough light to saturate the entire sensor. So these kind of optical aberrations really uh, show up. Um, it's probably hard to see, but on the right side, uh, you can see some of the fine dust, which are little circles, little donuts on there. Uh, that's probably dust on your main uh, lens or on the main mirror, uh, if this was a mirrored telescope. Um, the bigger donuts um, that are super faint, um, that look kind of like washers, uh, that's dust that's probably on your sensor itself or on your filters that are close to sensor if you run filters. And then the way you can see how the image uh, fades away, um, you got a kind of a bright center circle uh, and then it gets darker, there's concentric circles going out. That's the vignette from your, the light, the optical pathway of the light. Uh, if you don't calibrate these out, uh, then this noise really shows up exponentially as you uh, process your images. So it's uh, super important. Uh, you know, as for calibration, I'm not going to actually go into the details of what you actually do. Uh, that could be a whole talk for itself. Um, uh, but uh, essentially, um, there's some style of uh, pictures that you take. Uh, flat frames are used where you have a small light that you put in front of your um, camera, uh, in front of your telescope, and you take uh, fairly short uh, exposures up to about half uh, the uh, the uh, electron or ADU rate of your sensor. So if you run like a DSLR um, and you, you take a flat frame, you take a sh short exposure, uh, probably one to two seconds with this light source, uh, a clear light or a white light source, a very smooth light source at the end of your scope. Uh, and it captures what you see in this right side. It captures those uh, uh, materials. You take uh, anywhere from 20 to 40 of those um, and then you stack those together and you create a master flat frame. Uh, bias is uh, uh, on any kind of camera uh, that when you're running uh, electricity through it uh, and you just tell it to open the shutter or to expose any um, image, uh, the camera has what they call a bias noise and that's a certain amount of electron um, noise that'll show up as a static uh, for lack of a better word. Um, but uh, so you take a very short, um, you know, I put zero seconds in on my uh, imaging software um, and tell it to take a hundred uh, zero second images, which is just open and shut the shutter uh, to take these bias frames. Um, and, the, and then you stack those bias frames to create a master bias. Uh, Dark frames are the kind of the opposite of bias, where uh, when you take exposures for anywhere from you know 30 seconds to 15 minutes, um, there's some noise in the actual sensor that they call dark current on some cameras, especially CCD cameras, uh, and in uh, DSLRs that aren't cooled. Um, the dark frames are how you remove hot pixels. Uh, so if you've ever taken like a cell phone video or I mean a cell phone, a cell phone image or even a DSLR image at the nighttime uh, and you zoom in on it, you often see it's pockmarked with red, frame, uh, red pixels. Um, generally in the daytime, uh, there's more than enough light to saturate all of those uh, and they're just kind of lost. Um, but at nighttime, uh, you're not pulling in uh, nearly enough uh, to saturate those. So dark frames help you remove those. And then dark flats are um, 
uh, how you calibrate your flat frames, but I typically use bias. Um, dark flats um, are kind of done the same way you use a flat, where you close off the end of the camera, uh, end of the telescope, uh, and you take some pictures at the same length as your flat frames were taken, uh, but this time no light, um, and it helps uh, calibrate out uh, that bias noise um, that you can do straight with bias frames. So um, there's a not much you need to know about those other than just kind of understanding how they fit in. Uh, so, you know, getting started in astrophotography, um, this is the question I think a lot of people don't ask before they jump right in and buy things. Uh, and I think it's the most important question because uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, once you choose what you want to do that dictates what kind of technology and what kind of telescope you actually need to do that. Um, a lot of it parallels what you would do with uh, visual astronomy. So some of the same uh, choices and decisions are there, uh, but it's really compounded uh, with astrophotography because if you choose the wrong thing, you can choose a really difficult path uh, that makes it super hard to get started, very frustrating, um, very uh, nerve wracking and costly. Uh, you know, um, if you make the wrong decision, you can spend tens of thousands of dollars to try and uh, make it right or, you know, sell it out as a loss to try and recover your, your uh, expenditures there. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind as I go through this presentation, think of what you want to do. Uh, I kind of brought it down into three categories, uh, deep space imaging, uh, which would be your nebulas, um, your very uh, big wide field kind of things, uh, or a, a very long focal length for distant galaxies. Uh, the other one is planetary imaging um, and then terrestrial. Terrestrial is just uh, what I referred to earlier as uh, you know, the capturing the night sky as part of your terrestrial imaging. And to limit the scope of this uh, and to give some focus on the talk uh, so it wouldn't just drag on for a couple of days because there's a lot to digest. Uh, you know, my focus was the fascination with imaging nebulas. The thought that I can capture some of that in my backyard was uh, very intriguing. Uh, you know, I've loved astronomy, uh, watch astronomy shows all the time, read books. Um, you know, it's something I've been obsessed with and the idea that I can uh, do anything in my backyard to see through the haze and uh, light pollution and, uh, and to uh, capture this stuff from home um, was very intriguing. And, uh, you know, the perfect hobby to pick up with uh, COVID being around and more free time in the evenings. So the dive in and to what you need for astrophotography. Um, and I'll kind of talk about some of the commercial things that are popping up um, that are uh, people have had questions about, but uh, my focus is kind of on, uh, you know, a telescope, a mount and a camera and a computer. Um, not necessarily some of the uh, cell phone kind of cameras or cell phone combination telescopes that are coming out. I'll speak to that in a little bit. Um, but I think, you know, to get the most out of your backyard, you really do need um, a real refractor reflector. Um, DSLR is good. Uh, CMOS is, you know, superb. Uh, I say CMOS differently. The DSLR really is a CMOS, but uh, in astrophotography, CMOS cameras are usually cooled uh, in full spectrum, um, which I'll get into a little bit more. CCD was super popular, but it's uh, being uh, uh, replaced by CMOS for lack of a better word. Uh, there's a lot of people that really love what CCD has done in the years and they're really holding on to it, um, but it's moved more into the medical imaging and less in the consumer space. So it is extremely expensive to invest in CCD. And so, you know, I, I say get started with what you have, uh, you know, a DSLR that you've got a Canon or a Nikon are two of the best uh, that have drivers and capability to use with some of the open source software to get started. Uh, and in mounts, it's really about a German equatorial mount. Um, I wouldn't recommend uh, anything else to get started with um, if your if you're, uh, interest is uh, photography. Um, and on top of that, um, yeah, these are scopes that are great for astronomy, but not astrophotography. So. I'm sorry, the Dobsonian, I love these things. Uh, beautiful visual, uh, you know, they're okay if you wanna hold your cell phone up to them um, and take a quick shot and picture what you, 
you know, what your eye can see in there. Uh, you might be able to take a few seconds of a photo on some globulars or things that are um, pretty good with the stars that won't smear too quickly. Um, there's telescopes like these that have uh, clip-ons for putting your cell phone on. So if you want to take a snapshot and not have it shake the whole telescope, um, there's companies that do that. Uh, if you have a 3D printer, um, you can get on Thingiverse and you can download printables to hold your phone and lock it in there and uh, set up a timer and do some photos. So these are great for more, uh, I'm just getting started and want to see a picture rather than actually getting into astrophotography and uh, one to uh, focus on uh, really the data that you can get. Uh, these ones are huge. Uh, I used to want one. Um, you, know, uh, you know, for visual imaging, they're pretty awesome and stuff. Uh, but without a fork, uh, I mean, without a, um, a wedge, uh, you'll have field rotation on these if you try and do any length of imaging. Um, so they're they're good, again, kind of like the Dobsonian, where if you want to take a picture of what you're seeing, you can certainly do that. But if you want to actually process them like astrophotos, they're super difficult. Now, uh, there are ways where with some of these mounts, you can actually put a D rotator on them uh, or a camera rotator. Uh, it just gets super expensive because oftentimes you have to uh, modify your focuser. You have to modify the imaging uh, train to be able to support that. and on these uh, kind of scopes, there's usually not much room for that kind of stuff. So you kind of have to know what you're getting into if you choose that route um, versus you know, getting started. I wouldn't start with one of these. And then these are the ones that are popping up everywhere. Um, I say they're fantastic for outreach, but uh, uh, not so much good for backyard astrophotography. Uh, these are ones where if you throw it in the back of your car and drive out to uh, the dark sky, um, or the ranch, um, you know, they do better out there, um, but you will just, uh, more often than not, if you tried this like in your backyard in heat or, you know, any major city, you would end up with big white splotchy photos uh, with a couple of stars in it, um, if anything. Um, they really don't have the capability to be able to do what you need to do in your backyard to image. And if you're going to spend money, uh, I have other recommendations for things that you can do. Um, but for outreach, uh, you know, if you're setting up things for students and things like that, or just trying to learn the night sky, they're pretty cool for that. Um, but uh, super difficult in light pollution skies. So my theme through a lot of this is how to trade money for photons, because that's kind of the underlying um, tone of astrophotography. Um, you know, there's points you can start with, but if you get hooked, uh, there's no end into how much you can spend or how much you will spend on uh, trying to go faster, get bigger images or larger uh, framed images. Um, so, uh, you know, Aperture um, really plays a role uh, in what you choose to do. Um, so there's some uh, modern systems that actually cross uh, cross over in this kind of a strange way. So, you know, if you want to focus on deep space uh, objects and wide field, this is typically uh, very short and small apertures. Um, so your apochromatic or your, uh, your refractor type of scopes. Um, planetary can be refractors, but typically they're super long. Um, focal length, so, uh, and there'll be larger aperture than your uh, normal wide field. Um, uh, planetary can also, this is where SETs really shine. Uh, so like the Celestron C11 is super popular for uh, planetary imaging just because it can uh, pick up some resolution that's harder on acro, uh, uh, refractor type scopes. The speed, um, not so much of a problem planetary uh, because your big scopes and your long focal length scopes are generally going to be f10 or somewhere around there anyway um, and you use your camera technique to take images of those um, that are independent of uh, speed is what we call the speed of uh, your uh, telescope but for uh, deep space, nebula, wide field, uh, speed plays uh, kind of a huge role. Um, 
a lot of people will buy 100 millimeter, 120 millimeter, 150 millimeter scopes and put a focal reducer on them so that they get more aperture, but then they also get faster speed with the focal reducer. And that kind of helps them optimize their seeing, uh, their, their data collection. Um, but it's uh, one of those things that I wouldn't really recommend until you have some experience. Um, you know, buying a big scope requires a big mount, requires uh, complex uh, uh, connecting uh, of everything, uh, trying to get flat field, trying to get uh, nice round stars. Um, and then a lot of vendors uh, have uh, different products that may work for one scope, but not another. So it's a lot of trial and error to get to optimize your speed, but generally like your 80 millimeters, probably uh, F7 uh, by, you know, most consumer grade, uh, which is fine for getting started. And then, uh, you know, as you build up experience, you would put a focal reducer on them to get them down to F4 or F5.5 uh, to get a wider field of view, but also faster speed. Um, but primarily the focal length will define your field of view. Um, so whether that's uh, wide field or uh, deep field. And the camera technologies, uh, as mentioned earlier, CCD is charge couple devices. Um, that's kind of on its way out. Um, there's not many companies making sensors on there anymore. And the ones that do, you know, you're looking anywhere from uh, $5,000 to $20,000 for those kind of cameras. Uh, DSLR is super popular um, just because you can use it um, for normal photography or astrophotography. There are some gotchas with DSLR. Uh, DSLR is built for daytime imaging. So many cameras have uh, filters on them that actually block out some of the higher end red spectrum. Uh, and then, uh, as you progress through photography, the red spectrum becomes your uh, hydrogen alpha um, primary area. So you can actually do some modifications under DSLR or you can buy a pre-modified DSLR or um, Canon, I think still sells um, an astrophotography uh, specific one uh, where you can switch the modes on it uh, to uh, be able to capture that higher end spectrum. And then the primary one that's dedicated to astrophotography is uh, CMOS sensors. Uh, when you choose a camera, uh, there's a quality of it that kind of makes or breaks um, how much calibration you have to do, how long you have to expose your photos, um, and then how many you have to stack to be able to overcome your sensor. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, the read noise, uh, you know, when you take a daytime photo is overcome just by the sun, the sheer amount of uh, photons that you're collecting. But at nighttime, you're not able to overcome that entirely um, with collecting photons. Um, if you do, you often oversaturate your image and you actually lose color fidelity and uh, resolution. Your stars kind of get bloated uh, or you actually end up getting reflections through your image train if you take an image too long where you might actually pick up little circles of your filters or uh, uh, things like that. You'll you'll see as uh, you look through photos of people that are just starting some of those kind of things uh, that are part of the learning curve. Uh, but the read noise uh, in CCD was huge. The read noise in DSLR and CMOS is pretty near each other, but CMOS you can cool. Uh, they have uh, Peltiers on them so you can cool them down to negative 10 C or even cooler in the winter time. And that helps reduce that read noise and the hot pixel noise. And then the resolution uh, actually plays an interesting role and a difficult one to comprehend um, in uh, astrophotography. Uh, you know, when I first got started, I just kept researching, you know, the biggest uh, APS sensor with the most pixels, um, but it was kind of going down the, the wrong route um, because when you pair your camera with a telescope, you actually want to make sure that is correctly sampled. Um, so if you have a small pixel on a wide telescope, it can actually take longer to collect the amount of photons you need to overcome the sensor noise because of the sampling rate uh, between your telescope aperture and the pixel size um, is not optimal. Um, there's ways you can get around that if, it, if you can bin, which means you actually combine virtual uh, pixels together to be one pixel, then you can achieve that, uh, that uh, resolution that is correctly matched with your scope. Uh, it's a very detailed um, topic. Um, 
uh, you know, if you're getting started or interested in getting started, I would definitely ask uh, questions. Um, there's a website called astronomy.tools that you can go to um, and it has a calculator for CCD calculator, I believe it's called, um, but it's, you can plug in any kind of camera that's listed in there and your telescope and your, uh, your configuration and it'll help you choose whether you're sampled correctly. Um, it does change on sky rate. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you're correctly sampled in our uh, light blue skies, you may not be correctly sampled when you get to really dark skies, um, but there's ways to work around that. Uh, it's just one of the, the complexities of it and the, the weird things of the science on it that you pick up. Uh, the mount is probably your most uh, critical thing. Um, you know, I tell people start with the camera you have, but make an investment in a good mount uh, because this makes or breaks your entire experience. Um, you need a German equatorial mount uh, with go-to and tracking built in and then uh, preferably one with a USB interface. Uh, some of the older ones have serial, um, but it's super difficult to find serial adapters. Um, for computers that are sold these days. And then the USB to serial uh, is error prone um, and also not very dog safe. If your dog runs around the backyard and yanks up the cable, you know, you have to go and order a custom serial cable versus USB. Um, so I recommend uh, you know, a German equatorial mount with go to and USB built in. Uh, the load capacity you have to be just aware of. Um, Many consumer scopes are sold with a rating and weight and how much they can carry. But if there's a fine print, some of them will say half that rating is what is rated for for astrophotography. Um, not sure how that trend started, but it's something you have to be aware of. If you buy a telescope that says it can hold 50 pounds and you throw a big scope on it, um, but your AP rating was really uh, 25 pounds, you're going to have a, a terrible time with tracking. Um, uh, if stars are going to look out of shape. Uh, it's just going to be a headache. Uh, so a lot of the higher end scopes don't even, I mean, uh, higher end mounts uh, don't have that problem. Um, so I always say favor uh, spending money here um, if you can. And portability, um, you know, a, a mount that can hold 50 pounds of gear, it does weigh a bit, especially with the weights on it. Um, you know, if, if you're sometimes backyard, but mostly driving out somewhere in the darker skies, uh, choose something that's uh, slightly lighter and slightly more portable, but also know how that would impact your whole uh, imaging. Um, and this is just gonna kind of run through. Um, this was my first scope starting in the backyard. Uh, just kind of gonna break down and show you uh, what the components are, what each thing does, uh, what it, you know, how it was all built, uh, you know, this, uh, if you love my handy drawing, uh, that's just the telescope with the imaging train on it. Uh, so that when you hear people talk about what imaging train do you have, it's usually, you know, this was an Orion 8080. Um, so it has a FP53 glass in the front. Um, and this was a doublet uh, and it worked super well for getting started, great way to learn. Um, in the middle of COVID, I couldn't buy actual telescope weights and lost many bars or dovetail bars for a while. So I borrowed a hand weight and uh, zip tied that to the front to work around it so that it would be correctly balanced. But uh, otherwise, normally you don't have those hanging off your scope. Um, circled here is the, uh, the tracking or guide scope. Um, it's a small uh, I don't even know what the, the width of it is, but a 200 to 240 uh, millimeter focal length uh, with a, a tiny little black and white camera uh, that hangs on it. Um, and that, that helps do the guide assistance that I'll talk about a little bit more. This is the actual, what they call the imaging train when you're talking in cameras. Um, and, you know, the very beginning of the imaging train is the focal reducer, uh, and then their spacers, and then the red thing at the end is the camera. Uh, generally, when you get into astrophotography and you buy a camera, it's going to say like it has a backspace of 55 millimeters or something. So the uh, space uh, in the middle between the focal reducer and the camera, that's just providing that backspace so that the camera is in prime focus. Um, and it has optimal coverage of the camera sensor uh, in the image train. 
Uh, this was a, a robotic focuser. Um, it's not required. Um, you can use a Batonov mask uh, to focus uh, if you already have those. Uh, but I've found if you're, uh, you know, if you're spending money on astrophotography, um, and like me, I still had to get up and go to work the next morning, the focuser, um, which you can bolt on on almost any kind of telescope out there, uh, you just pull the knob off, uh, unscrew the knob, uh, put this uh, contraption on. Um, and then mount the brackets on your scope um, and run it through software and it'll uh, run with your camera to autofocus. Uh, super handy and not just to get the focus down really good, um, but focus will change and shift through the night. Uh, so being able to just let your scope image all night and autofocus um, whenever it notices that shift uh, is a great time saver and sleep saver. This is a, you know, the Batonov mask. Someone actually just cut out of paper. You can do the same thing. Again, if you have a 3D printer, uh, there's lots of uh, stuff on Thingiverse to be able to download this. Um, and it's, uh, it's a way to focus where you create a pattern on the stars and you try and get the pattern to be uh, uh, tight. Uh, the Wikipedia article has a lot more depth on it. And I recommend just go Googling or Bing and uh, Batonov mask. Uh, a little too much to put in here to teach you how to do it, but it's an option for focusing. Here, just circle the mount. Uh, this is a EQ6R mount. Um, it's a very heavy duty, robust. As you can see, it's got a USB port. I uh, don't have the hand controller connected to it. Uh, the little lens on the end uh, there on the back side is actually the polar alignment lens. So you actually look through that to polar align. Uh, so as the scope is set up, when I took this photo, it is polar aligned. Um, but it's a heavy duty German equatorial mount. Um, Skywatcher makes these. And unfortunately with COVID restrictions, um, they're impossible to find. Uh, if you get on cloudy nights or Astromark, you might be able to find some used ones. Um, this company makes really good products across the board, whether you wanna do portable or uh, heavy duty. Uh, they have mounts that can hold up to 200 pounds of gear. Uh, this one was built around uh, 50, uh, 50 pounds uh, and is rated for astrophotography at 50 pounds. Uh, you know, getting started, the apochromatic scope is just hard to beat. Uh, apochromatic uh, is a refractor, but it has uh, uh, lenses that are built in to help eliminate the uh, uh, dis uh, dispersion of the light so that your RGB is correctly imaged. Um, if you don't have a, if you have an achromatic, um, your colors and your stars will probably look a little bloated uh, because as the light comes through your scope, the RGB uh, colors uh, spread out differently. Uh, so that's why I recommend an apochromatic because uh, generally it just gives you the sharpest stars, the best color, the best resolution, and the least amount of hassle. A doublet is good enough. A triplet, if you can afford spending uh, you know, that much more, uh, is better. Cameras, you know, start with a DSLR if you have it. Uh, if you're super intrigued and want to get into uh, astrophotography uh, and you know that's something you want to do, then the ASI 533, uh, which is a little red camera there, um, is one that's just hard to beat. Uh, it's a color camera, it's simple, plugs right in, uh, comes with everything you need to connect it to your telescope for most uh, telescopes. And it's extremely forgiving. Uh, I'll get more into that a little bit. Uh, so it, it can cool down. Uh, it's super easy to get up and running. It works with all the open source and commercial programs to image. Uh, you know, the benefit of an astro camera over DSLR is it's sensitive again in the full spectrum, which is important for uh, super faint nebula, uh, especially with hydrogen alpha being in the red. You can cool them down. They have the Peltier and a fan. Uh, so in the summer, I can get it to about zero degrees Celsius. Uh, in the winter, typically run them at negative 15 to negative 20. Uh, and that just helps reduce the noise. Uh, these Astro cameras are ASCOM controlled, and I'll dive in a little bit more in that. Um, uh, and some of them have a heated do window, which this time of year is super, super nice because uh, as you cool the camera, if it doesn't have the heated do window, um, you might frost up a little bit and it causes weird aberrations. Uh, you know, another option you have, uh, which kind of goes up in price, is your mono camera. Um, mono cameras, you have to run filters. Uh, so for color, you have your luminance, red, green, and blue filters. Um, this is just a sample photo with the filter wheel where the filters are contained inside there. Um, 
for narrow band, you run the SHO filters, which is sodium, hydrogen, alpha, and oxygen three. Uh, you can get filter wheels that'll hold all seven or eight of those. Uh, they're pretty ginormous, but it means you can have uh, electronic uh, filter rotation and with your software that you take photos, you can run through a whole sequence of them. So you don't have to stay up all night trying to swap them out or anything like that. But the mono camera doesn't have the Bayer matrix and uh, you can take mono photos straight with luminance or if you like narrow band, a lot of people will just do mono with hydrogen alpha. Uh, to get started, uh, SHO filters can get super expensive and a large UB is uh, much more affordable. And the mount, again, EQ6R is kind of hard to beat, but again, uh, the mount is the most critical thing, I would say, even before camera and telescope. You know, if you have an acromatic and you haven't bought an Apple yet, you, know, you can start with acromatic. Um, you know, you just have to know that the stars may be a little bloomy uh, in comparison. You know, and if you have a DSLR, you know, buy the mount before you buy an Astro camera because if you if you cheap it on the mount, it's just going to cause headaches. Uh, and then a computer, uh, you know, if you have a laptop, laptops work great. Um, these little mini PCs are great. Uh, I have a little one that I just zip tie on the, the mount of the scope. Um, and then I remote desktop in to control it. Um, otherwise, uh, it's something that can sit out, get due on it and not fail. Um, it's nice to have. Uh, I just sit in my house and uh, remote desktop in to do my imaging with the PC running in the backyard. And you know, to answer kind of the question that all this leads to, I, I highly recommend, and especially since I did Nebula and that's what I loved, uh, you know, start with something that's 60 to 80 millimeters. Uh, you know, I always thought bigger was better, um, but in hindsight, you know, if you want nebulosity and big wide field images, then even a 60 millimeter um, is fantastic. And that's probably the number one telescope selling right now. Uh, for this kind of stuff. Again, the ASI 533, um, if you Google that, it's a type of camera that's a small and very forgiving camera. Uh, you need a guide scope, guide camera, mount, computer, uh, and Nina is the software that I run, uh, which I'll dive into a little more here. Uh, the nice thing about astronomy is uh, over the years, people have got together and made an open source solution that's called ASCOM and it's uh, as comes to standard based drivers um, that allow software to talk to all of these components and uh, allows you to automate your telescope or talk to the mount and uh, run a sequence and take images uh, without having to buy or use software that's for a specific, specific mounts or specific cameras or anything. Uh, so it's an open standard that all the tools speak as come to talk to your cameras and mounts and filter wheels and things like that. And it's open source. So it's kind of good that the community is really coming together for things like that. Uh, you know, this is kind of just uh, dive into the 100 foot view here. Uh, you know, when you're doing astrophotography, you know, you set up the polar line your scope, get your gear up and running out in the backyard. Uh, you know, the idea is you take images, but you take dozens, if not hundreds of images. You know, uh, I recommend that. Uh, you don't uh, don't go too crazy because uh, if you take a lot of images, you have to supplement that with computing power. And uh, but I find when I got started, uh, I was so amazed at everything that after about five to ten images, I was off to the next target just to see if I could see it. Uh, so uh, when you're getting started, uh, sometimes you have to remind yourself that you need more images uh, before you move on to the next thing. Uh, you stack these images. That's a big word that uh, may have come up earlier, but uh, when you take an image, uh, the detail and resolution isn't there um, by itself. But when you stack the images, you actually uh, combine uh, all of these separate images that are taking and it's additive uh, to where it, uh, your resolution, the clarity and the detail uh, really starts to pop whenever you stack um, images together. And basically stacking is, you know, say if you have uh, M31 and you take 40 photos of it, you stack those together with some software uh, that stacks them, calibrate them. Uh, and then once you've stacked them, that's called an integrated frame. And that integrated frame is what gives you the detail and resolution that you can't see, you know, with the naked eye or can't see with just looking through the telescope or a single image. Um, and that stacking is why the, uh, the other scopes I didn't recommend that are based on cell phones is kind of, uh, it's super hard to do um, with that kind of uh, setup. 
and then you process your image. Um, you know, the, this is uh, a very detailed uh, um, area of astrophotography. That's probably the biggest learning curve, especially if, if you're doing visual, a lot of this stuff is probably sounds familiar with focal lengths, wide field, narrow field, uh, you know, how you match your optics to seeing things like that. Um, but the processing is where you take your integrated stack and you clean it up, you denoise it, you, you might remove some gradients if you have a light pollution, which is super popular here. Um, and there's, there's websites. Uh, I have a lot of uh, information on my website as well on how to do that. So I'm not going into details there. And then obviously, you know, share it, share it with your friends and family. Um, you know, uh, it's kind of, you know, the hundred foot view. Now we'll dive into uh, what it actually goes on when you run astrophotography. And I'm doing this agnostic of software because there's literally 50, if not more programs out there, you can choose to do these uh, type of events or sequences, we call them. Um, so, you know, set up your scope, you got it up and running, you're taking some images, but, uh, you know, you, you focus um, your polar line, uh, you, you run your autofocus if you have an autofocus or you focus with a bat nub mask. It's super critical to get focus in right. Uh, these modern free software programs uh, will control either your telescope slew through the USB port and they'll plate solve. Uh, plate solving is a way to do astrometry. So it'll uh, telescope the slew um, to where that object should be. It'll take a photo, it'll download it, it'll compare the stars and then tell the telescope to correct any correction so that it actually points to where it should be. And it'll run through that cycle and uh, sync uh, back to the telescope to tell it the star model and where it is so that as you image through the night, uh, it can then always be centered. Uh, in addition to plate solving, that also centers your object. So if you if you say you want to image M31, a lot of the programs you can just type in M31 in a sequence generator that it has, and they'll go, all right, I know the coordinates to that. Um, and it'll, you know, you tell it how long you want to take exposures and how many exposures and that you want it to center. Uh, and this does a lot of the hard work um, that you would have to do manually of kind of uh, spinning your scope around or doing a spiral search with your hand controller. This, you know, says, hey, I'm going to this coordinate, I'm going to plate solve, and I'm going to center on the image. So like what you think you're going to image is going to be exactly framed how you see it on your camera in the preview. Um, it's super neat to see this happen. Um, uh, it's one of the, the cool things in modern technology. So if you know how to run a computer, you know how to install some open source software, the software, once you get it all been running, takes care of all these complexities for you. Uh, super nice. Uh, you know, the same camera that you use for centering does tracking. Tracking helps keep the stars uh, centered and corrects your scope uh, or your mount um, for any corrections that need to happen. Um, consumer grade mounts or moderately priced mounts have to have tracking to assist in guiding. Uh, you can invest in very expensive mounts. Um, that don't need tracking called unguided mounts and they just have the precision uh, to do that but uh, you know you're looking at ten thousand plus dollars just for the mount um, for those kind of uh, precisions without tracking and then as you move through you run what you call your sequence which is your image and then you do there and if you have a focuser you can tell it to refocus on temperature change uh, SETs are huge with focus temperature changes um, the, uh, the refocus also understands, like if you say you have an APO, um, then uh, it does focusing a little bit different than if you have something with a mirror um, so that the focus is always outward. So if there's a mirror flop, it corrects for that kind of stuff. So it's, it's pretty neat how the software does a lot of the, the complex things that uh, uh, make uh, imaging hard without uh, a real telescope combination system. Uh, and this is something as you get into astrophotography that uh, they're going to tell you to dither, 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 um, dither, dither, dither. <laughs> beat it in. Uh, dithering is a way like when you're taking an image, uh, you actually tell it that between every so many frames that you want to collect, that you uh, tell the guides, the guider to adjust it by a few pixels in a random direction so that you actually change how everything is hitting your sensor so that your light is not always hitting the same pixels. Um, this helps compensate for hot pixels. This helps for compensate for noise. Um, and then dithering also affords you um, 
processing capability further on down the end. Uh, and then for color cameras, it's super critical uh, because you can bear drizzle, which is a way to process your image um, that can overcome uh, our uh, Bayer matrix actually being RGGB on top. Um, used to require it to infer what the color on the neighboring pixels were. So if something landed on the blue, but it was green, it would infer how green that was, or if it was red, it would have to infer how uh, green the neighboring um, pixel was. But the Bayer drizzle is a way to take that uh, dither and calculate what the actual colors are. And it really helps the fidelity uh, and a bunch of other reasons or other things. Um, so if you, if you don't know much about dithering, uh, you can get on Cloudy Nights and look it up. You'll probably see me championing it on there, uh, and many other people as well. So this is an example of um, a single raw sub. So if you were to take a, this is a five minute exposure done from my backyard here in Austin of uh, Nebula. Uh, so off, off the top of my head, I can't remember. Crescent time. Nebula. Yeah, Crescent Nebula. So. Uh, as you can see here, a single image picks up uh, you know, a good good bit of detail. Um, and if you look really close, unfortunately, the compression of copying it into here kind of makes it look splotchy. But you see some darker areas and lighter areas. Um, and in it, but uh, you really have to kind of zoom in. Uh, the processing software lets you do that. So this is just, I stretched it. And I can see, hey, it's there. It's center. It looks really cool. I'm getting some of the faint nebulosity. Um, this is what it looks like when you stack. 45 of them. Uh, and I chose this image on purpose because I actually had something wrong with my camera that I discovered was a bug uh, and how the camera was set up. But it turned out to create a really cool image in the end. Um, so in this one, you can see there's quite a bit more detail when there's 45 of them stuck together, but there's this weird purple color. Um, that's kind of overbearing. Um, sometimes this scares you on color cameras. It's usually like green because the color cameras are actually RGGB instead of RGB. So there's two green um, for terrestrial and uh, uh, Bayer matrix imaging. The green actually is what picks up the, the resolution um, of things. So the, there's double the green just so you can get double the uh, resolution, almost like a luminance for a narrow band. So this one, um, you know, you can see there's a little bit more cloud visibility and some darker spots. Um, but uh, when I cleaned it up and actually did the processing, this is what it actually came into. Um, and uh, this one just kind of popped out and I've shared it online. Uh, uh, you know, it's very deep red. Uh, at first I was like, I don't know what the heck is going on here, but it kind of grew on me because of the amount of texture that it can bring out. Um, and then I got a little bit of the oxygen. If you look closely in the crescent, you can see some of like a green or a little contrast to the red. I think it would have been a little bit better had I discovered um, what the issue was. But when I shared this online, I started asking around, you know, is, uh, are these cameras, you know, I knew uh, uh, astrophotography cameras when they're cooled and dedicated, they pick up the red, but I didn't think it would turn this red. And it turns out they're, the white balance was wrong from the factory. So it was kind of an interesting way to work with the community and figure out uh, the white balance issue. Uh, but it also, I learned how I could use white balance to do images like this. Like if I really want to make the contrast pop out, I can go back to the way that white balance was misconfigured and, and repeat that process. Now, the problem with the white balance configuration is it's actually put into your raw data. So you kind of have to refer, uh, fix it post-processing and you can't correct it back as much as you would hope. Um, so it was kind of a bummer that it happened. I had to delete some old images, um, but uh, I learned to live with it and I really love what came from it. Uh, so, uh, you know, software, uh, I love the open source software. So I really love Nina. Nina, nighttime imaging and astronomy is what it stands for. Uh, it's open source, great community. SGP is a uh, Super popular one. I put a dollar sign next to it because it is. Uh, they're moving towards subscription. It's not very expensive. It's super robust. Uh, super reliable. People really love it. Uh, Ecos uh, is super popular with Linux and K stars. Uh, if you love programming, Ecos is something uh, where you can program to your you know your heart's desire and customize everything. And an apt, I believe, is from some guys here even in Austin area. Um, costs uh, maybe forty or fifty dollars. Very. And maybe a little bit more now, but it's very, very popular for DSLR imagers um, just because it works really well with uh, controlling Canons and Nikons. 
but all of them can control DSLRs except Sony. Some reason Sony cameras are just not supported. Uh, Sony DSLRs are not supported, which is kind of interesting because Sony dominates the photog astrophotography sensor realm. So I guess they just don't want to lose that money. Uh, integration software is what takes, so you take your images um, with your imaging software and the integration software is what takes your, your individual photos and stacks them. Uh, Deep Sky Stacker is an open source one that does a really good job. And it picks insights, kind of the expensive uh, Photoshop of astrophotography that has integration built in. There is another um, French uh, program that's out there that I couldn't remember the name of, but uh, when I share these slides, I'll make sure to update it to recommend that one because it's kind of following in the footsteps of PixInsight, but open source and not a couple hundred dollars. For one that's in between uh, Deep Sky Stacker, which is free, and PixInsight, which is much more pricey. Nebulosity is about $70, I think. Oh, okay. And does have some pretty good ability to control Canon cameras, Nikon cameras, and some limited processing capability inside the, at least for pre-processing. So like be able to remove, uh, calibrate your frames and all of that. The basics of it are in there. Yeah. You'll want to upgrade as you get more experience, but it's a starting point. Yeah, there's, uh, like I said, there's a uh a huge amount of these programs and it's kind of cool to see um, and, uh, COVID brought in a huge resurgence. So a lot of them are kind of coming back to life and seeing new development and new features and competing with each other. So it's kind of, I would say it's a renaissance of astrophotography, honestly, because the price on cameras is really coming down the telescope technology is shooting up and uh, you can kind of just choose, you know, if you want to support open source, go for it. If you got some money um, and uh, like what some of those programs have, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of choices. Uh, so for image processing, PixSight, um, it's kind of, again, the premier one. Um, PixInsight uh, is kind of like Photoshop uh, superficially, but the, the idea with PixInsight is you're not manipulating the image, um, uh, but you're actually enhancing it. Uh, you're removing noise, you're uh, stretching the colors, you're correcting the colors. Um, so it actually includes scientific approaches to that, where you can calibrate against uh, star catalogs, you can calibrate against uh, uh, star maps. Um, you can download data from the internet and use that to help correct images. Um, so whereas Photoshop, you're going in and you're actually altering what those pixels are without regard to correction. Um, I'm not a purist because technically almost everything we do is false color anyway. Um, so I, you know, it's, uh, doesn't, there are some people that advocate one way or another, but I'm not really in concern with that. Uh, another uh, thing that's like Photoshop is GIMP. Um, it's a uh, graphics image manipulation program is what it stands for, but it's more like Photoshop in that you can edit, you can do everything. There are some uh, open source tools that are being developed for that to really kind of uh, improve it. Uh, Photoshop is subscription these days, but it's $10 a month. Um, it's not terribly bad. Um, PixInsight is a one-time purchase, but it is a few hundred dollars. Um, so again, in the software, uh, the ASCOM is what abstracts out everything. Uh, so you got your focuser, filter wheels, cameras, dome controls, mount controls, flat panel weather. There's a whole list of uh, services that when you uh, buy these products or try and connect these software to whatever choice of acquisition program you have, uses ASCOM drivers to do that connectivity. Uh, and this just saves you from having to use specific software from a specific vendor to use a specific mount. It's kind of nice that they agreed on this. Um, there's several other standards that are, uh, uh, there's INDI, um, there's uh, one or two others. ASCOM is moving to a network-based approach. So you can actually have network computers connect and talk devices. I think they call it Alpaca or something like that. But uh, this is just the interface that allows everything to have a common communications model. Um, and then planetariums, uh, as the room was mentioned earlier, uh, is absolutely great. Uh, I recommend any of these planetarium programs for getting to know the night sky. Uh, they also can control your telescope. So if you're familiar with using these to control your scope, you can use these to target for SLU. Um, a lot of the programs you can go in and choose what target you want. And then you go to your acquisition software and say, hey, uh, I want to pull in what I'm targeting in Stellarium. And it'll talk to Stellarium and download it and center it and create a sequence around it. Um, 
so they're uh, just good tools. Uh, you know, I recommend software over buying books and sky maps and things like that, just because they're great. Uh, online tools, Astrobin is great for sharing. Astrobin is also great for learning. Uh, so if you have a telescope or you have a camera or you have anything, you can go in Astrobin and search, just say, you know, have Canon DSLR and it'll find everybody that shared images with that. And then you can go message those people and ask what kind of uh, experience they have and things like that. Uh, Telescopius um, is kind of coming around with doing lots of cool things where you can create mosaics on there and then download those mosaics to run on your software or just see what's up in your night sky for this day. Uh, and then astronomy tools is just a whole bunch of tools for uh, letting you know uh, how your system would behave, what the best seeing is. Uh, and then also they have a link to the, the cool uh, cloud watch that will show you what your sky condition is. And books. Um, I had a book in there. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's millions of books out there, um, but the one book that I would recommend, uh, you know, if you're just going to spend maybe $45 or whatever, uh, is the Astrophotography Manual. Uh, it's on Amazon, um, covers everything that I'm covering, goes into super detail, but also has a bit on processing, uh, which is uh, you know, just super helpful um, uh, for a single book to have as reference. But, you know, uh, wife, every time I'm like, hey, I'm thinking of picking this up, you know, how much does it cost? Um, that's the million dollar question. It's really as much as uh, how much you can spend. Uh, but again, <laughs> it's the investment. If you're gonna, if you're gonna start with a camera you have and start with a telescope you might already have or a telescope that you can borrow or a telescope that you can buy that you're, you're familiar with, get those to spend the money on the mount. Um, you know, if you're doing deep, uh, deep space, um, you know, you can start with a smaller setup, smaller scope, uh, DSLR uh, works really good there. Planetary requires a little more aperture, which uh, means bigger scope. It requires longer focal length, which longer focal length translate into very good mount. Uh, you need very good tracking. Otherwise, you'll get uh, stars that look like tadpoles or blurry images. Uh, so planetary is actually like, you know, when a lot of people get started with astrophotography, they're kind of thinking planetary might be the best way to go because you can see Mars, but it's actually one of the most difficult things to master. Um, and uh, in, in many ways, one of the more uh, cost prohibitive things to get started with, which is kind of funny because it's, it's the telescope and mount that you spend the money on, whereas the camera, the planetary cameras are much more affordable, but you typically wouldn't use a DSLR or anything that we have. And then hybrid is the absolute uh, cheapest way to go. You can buy mechanical mounts that are super tiny. It might cost a couple hundred dollars, if that much. Um, so you can set it on a rock and have it uh, do a, a long exposure um, and then just rewind it and take another long exposure and no batteries required or anything like that. Um, so the hybrid or terrestrial um, is a super easy way to get started with it. And you know, through everything, it's all about the SNR, signal to noise ratio. Everything you do is to increase the signal or reduce the noise. So you got your calibration frames to help reduce the noise of your aberrations in your, in your scope and on your sensor. And then you stack as many frames as you can to reduce the noise. Um, it's a super complicated thing, but it's actually kind of simple. Um, you know, you, you take images um, and then you stack them and then that stack, uh, is additive, but there is a cost to that stack. Uh, you know, it's uh, diminishing returns. Uh, you'll hit a certain point where you're adding more photos. You'd have to just add so much more photos that the only way you can get more data is if you bought a bigger telescope because it just never, you know, the diminishing returns kind of defeats you. Um, there's different ways to improve uh, the SNR. Um, you know, the uh, with the deep space objects, um, you know, the SNR, uh, a lot of people will optimize with focal reducers to try and speed up their system, to try and capture more photons in a faster system. Planetary, you take a lot more photos um, and uh, it just takes hundreds of photos. I mean, you're probably doing two or 300 frames per second on some of those cameras. Um, and then uh, hybrid, uh, you know, it's just uh, however many photos you can get in the session, uh, uh, but clearer skies matter the most there. Uh, and DSO is, uh, you know, the, here's the elephant trunk. Um, you know, there's, uh, as mentioned just a second ago with wide field, focusing on nebula and big clusters, 
there's different ways to optimize that, uh, you know, in your backyard, uh, the narrow band technique of capturing them is the best way to capture them. Broadband is good on new moon nights, but otherwise uh, with the moon and sky glow and light pollution, broadband is super difficult. So a lot of times there's this huge debate of, you know, you should just buy a narrow band camera and spend the extra money on filters and everything else uh, stinks. And uh, But I, I haven't really bought into that. Uh, I found color has worked really good. And then in color cameras, you can put narrow band filters in front of them that actually are, are not super hard. You can, if you know you're just gonna shoot narrow band, you can just uh, screw the filter in on your focal reducer usually, leave it there, never worry about it and just enjoy taking photos. Um, you know, it's uh, when you're deep space imaging or any kind of imaging, it's always time, 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 time. You know, the time translates to your SNR, um, the time and location. You want your object to be above the horizon, obviously, above the trees. Um, the higher you can get above 30 degrees, it's just like uh, visual observing. If you can get above the lower atmosphere, you're going to have much better uh, data. So that limits the time of, uh, you know, how far. Uh, you can actually image imaging time is time like how long you can actually have the exposure running it's not uncommon for five minutes to kind of be like the industry standard for lack of a better word um, so you need to take lots of five minute uh, images um, and an integration time is uh, the cumulative effect of stacking those images um, processing time there's a trade-off if you take tons of small photos because it's super bright and light polluted and you can't take long ones because they wash out, then you spend a lot more time on processing and integration because uh, the, the computation and uh, calculating of stacking all that together is a lot of time. And then you learn uh, what can I do to optimize that time. You know, here I just showcase um, the Cygnus region, you know, make sure it's above 30 degrees. This is head and right up. Um, uh, you don't want to image below um, you know, the imaging time is impacted by light pollution. It's, image, uh, it's impacted by the moon. And, you know, if you're near the moon, you can't take long exposures because the moon will saturate your camera. You can try a light pollution filter, but even then you reduce your, um, your imaging time. Uh, uh, imaging time depends on your camera. A DSLR is going to need probably shorter imaging time because of the hot pixels um, than the C uh, CCD or CMOS. CCD needs the longest imaging time to get over its noise. Um, and then uh, as you progress through, you, you know, you want to take images where you're not clipping pixels, that you're not oversaturating, I think star bloat. Um, a lot of it's just through experimentation because there's no, there's math behind it, but the math can't describe the variability of your skies and everything um, in, a, in a fashion that any one person can handle. Um, integration time again, uh, it's got a diminishing return uh, as the signal to noise grows as the square root of time or a number of images. Um, so, uh, you know, if you think you can just take an eight hour long sub, you probably could in some CCDs, but it's probably better to take eight one hour subs or even better to take 100 10 minute subs and most of that is because you're going to have things that fail there's going to be an airplane that flies over someone's going to shoot fireworks uh, there's going to be uh, spacex launching satellites normally satellites you can calibrate out but when there's 50 of them screeching on by uh, you know might ruin that sub if you had an hour long sub you know you lost a tenth of your data but if you if you had 10 minute subs they might have only lost one uh, again uh, shorter five minutes is about average Processing time, you know, this is just to reiterate what I mentioned earlier, you know, do I have enough data? Uh, am I having the trade compute time? Or am I, you know, should I take longer exposures? And then the best improvement to all of this is dark skies. Uh, you know, you can buy a mono camera and super expensive filters, um, but it's not going to change your skies. You know, dark skies, dark skies, dark skies. The, the best data you can get uh, is out of the city. Um, so, uh, you know, if you become obsessed with data, um, and you don't want to spend a few nights imaging that data and you want to reduce that time, um, then dark skies happens. But you can overcome a lot of uh, the processing time simply with uh, how extending how much time you collect data. Uh, and this is just a summary of you know, faster scope, larger aperture, faster cameras. There's a whole, whole bunch of things that you can trade your money for time as you progress through the hobby. Um, but I wouldn't worry about all of these and trying to get pet 
perfect up front. Uh, there's a huge learning curve. Um, you know, the this just uh, summarizes. You know, the light pollution is a is an issue. Um, you know, narrow band is the secret sauce to backyard astrophotography and capturing deep space things, and then uh, being able to uh, just see them more clearly. Uh, this is a scope uh, that I'm currently running. So it's a 120. I have the filter wheel on it and the camera and the off axis guider. It's kind of what I've moved into. Uh, you can see the little focuser that uh, invested in a smaller one. Um, you know, ran this in my backyard for a while. I got it, got hooked, and it's actually in an observatory in Texas now. And I was hoping to be able to do a live uh, demo of it, but uh, it's unfortunately cloudy up in Throckmorton right now. Um, but planetary is the other one, and I'm, I'm going to kind of speed through this just to kind of cover it. It's a lot of the same stuff of uh, deep space, but uh, there's some gotchas with planetary. Um, you know, the same thing as before, exact same slide. You know, you want to make sure that the planet, if you're going to focus on Jupiter or Mars that is higher up on the horizon, that you don't want to go through the soupy atmosphere, uh, dark skies, um, don't quite matter as much because they're usually running a longer focal length or wider aperture. Um, it's all about seeing and visibility. Um, and then time is uh, you want to take as many small photos as possible. And in processing the time is the software that pulls those photos out, um, what they call lucky imaging. And then optimizing time is kind of the same thing. How do you process those lucky images? So what lucky images is you're you're uh, observing Mars or observing Jupiter and you want a really fast camera that's taking a video essentially at a few hundred frames per second and it's taking just as fast as it can um, uh, to kind of brute force its way through seeing. Uh, your seeing is going to be shaky and wobbly as atmosphere disturbs but if you take 10 or 20,000 photos super quick in these videos um, you might get a dozen or two dozen or three dozen uh, really good ones that they can pull out and then you can uh, sample those together and stack them um, or take a little movie of them and actually show like the rotation of Mars or uh, moons going around, things like that. So looking at imaging is really just the idea of just a zillion photos super fast uh, for as long as you can, uh, track well as it crosses the sky. Uh, and then pulling out um, through software the best images. And it does all that automatically, like it calculates the signal to noise, that the, it can compare against good samples, and uh, you're not having to uh, blink through them yourself or look through anything. Um, so again, with imaging time, you know, the faster camera you have, the faster disk, the faster computer, the more you can really crank that out to increase your odds of getting a good lucky image. Uh, integration time is kind of the same with planetary. Um, as many images as you can. Uh, you're not stacking them all, you're just pulling out the ones that you like. So anything that optimizes that uh, uh, will increase your odds of getting really good planetary images. And in time, same thing. Um, you know, the compute and uh, speed of your camera uh, really matters here. Uh, ironically, uh, imaging camera, you know, as mentioned earlier, uh, really big scopes, so really long focal length and really good mounts to check uh, planets. But the cameras themselves are much cheaper. Um, so there's there's trade-offs. Uh, you might be a few hundred dollars for a really fast uh, camera. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, you know, planetary imaging, uh, even though it's the first one you think of doing oftentimes, it's usually the most difficult. Um, not every year the seeing is great. Um, down here, the skies can be really turbulent. Uh, it really depends on the season. Luckily, we don't have to worry about the jet stream as much. Get further up north, the jet stream really um, rips through and uh, uh, makes it difficult to do planetary. Uh, but this year, with Mars being so close, there was a lot of people getting into it, and it was pretty cool to see what they were getting. Uh, dark skies are uh, really good, uh, but the best uh, thing you can have is good seeing. You know, the higher the planets up in the uh, sky, the better uh, you'll be able to get out of the really uh, uh, disturbed lower atmosphere. And then the, this is terrestrial, just wanted to cover it. I mean, this is kind of what most people think of when they're capturing their vacation photos of things and they want the, the Milky Way in the background. And again, it's all the same. Uh, what you learn on all of them, you know, the time in this one is actually a little more like, you know, you want it to be perfectly timed because the Milky Way might not be up when you're, <laughs> when you're up. So it's the same thing, you know, you plan it in your astronomy program, you plan your location. Uh, you won't take nearly as many subs, you won't have to, you might focus on slightly 
longer exposures, but this would be typically work that you do in Photoshop where you, you might take a really good pictures of your background um, and then have those separate from your pictures of the horizon and the sky above it so that you can merge them to make them easier to do. Um, so there's a lot more flexibility, experimentation and fun um, that this one has and it's not as complex, the gears, backpackable gear and things like that. But the same, you know, it's all you know, the detail, the resolution, how much data you can get is all uh, how much time you can put in. And then uh, if you have money to beat time, you can pay to work around it, but it just gets uh, super expensive. Um, this just kind of recovers, uh, you know, the DSLR is a great way to get this. Uh, cell phones, I think are going to dominate here. And um, there's little lenses you can put on your cell phone, uh, little trackers that you can do that you can buy on some of these Kickstarters that will rotate your camera around and just make it ultra portable. So it's kind of a neat way to get started with uh, photography. Um, and the final advice um, is really, um, you know, choose how much you want to spend, stick to it because uh, you're gonna, you can spend as much as you want and you're really trading money to get the upper hand, um, you know, to, to beat time, to reduce time, uh, to get better data and all that, um, you know, you're, you're, you end up in focal reducers, bigger scopes, bigger mounts, darker skies, uh, uh, it adds up. Um, and then, you know, all, all in all, just start, um, you know, the, it's very rewarding no matter where you begin. Um, don't get into the trap of reading too much about it and then thinking you have to spend $10,000 to get going. Uh, I see a lot of people that, um, you know, they don't want to go through the steps because they see what people are creating. But I think because a lot of the fun is, you know, your first photo of uh, a globular cluster, which isn't terribly hard, but the first time you see it on your camera and you stack the images and it comes out pretty good and see more detail than you've ever seen before, uh, you know, those those are good learning steps and good things to share. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think you hit, uh, I wouldn't save up your money or, uh, think you have to have the best gear in the world to get started. Uh, you can start with uh, pretty much anything you got. And then uh, some links, um, you know, the SNR is very detailed. Uh, John Rista is a super uh, big astrophotographer with DSLRs and other cameras. He's got a great blog that I link there. Nina is where you can go and download that acquisition software. Uh, Stellarium is probably pretty common. Uh, and my blog, uh, if you want to check that out. Uh, I publish almost all my data, well, all of my data. I haven't published all of it. Uh, I publish it all on there so you can download it. So if you want to do astrophotography, but you don't want to buy a telescope or don't want to buy the gear, you can download my data. You still have to figure out the programs and the processing. Um, you can stack the images if you want. Um, I create walkthroughs to show uh, how to do everything. So it's kind of cool if you want to uh, check that out. Um, my goal is knowing that it's super expensive to get into astronomy and astrophotography. Uh, I just wanted to be able to say, hey, I'm publishing all my data. I don't want to take it to the grave with me when I die. It's all out there, open source. You can download it, you can print it, put it on your wall, um, do whatever you want with it. Um, uh, happy to share it. Uh, and then I use that to, just to teach. Um, teach people how to do it, hopefully teach my kids how to do it. And then uh, more importantly, yeah, I just want to, you know, uh, I found it odd when I was looking at places to put my telescope gear that they actually license your data. So uh, I spent a lot of time looking for places to, for dark skies and they restricted how you could share it. They, you know, they can't share it. You can only uh, sell uh, limited copies. It was interesting that I didn't, didn't know uh, uh, photographers and uh, observatories that actually did that. The me and like, it's your sky here, check it out. Don't forget it's up there. And hopefully we can make some dark skies and work with those to make it better to do in our backyard. And that's kind of, uh, you know, it, uh, this was, uh, this image right here is the, um, again, the elephant trunk nebula. And this was done from Throckmorton, Texas. Um, and that's my first light at my dark sky observatory that I set up. And this was done with a color camera running uh, narrowband filters, uh, the triad ultra narrowband filter. So uh, this in my backyard, I uh, got something pretty close to this. Uh, it took about 14 hours to get that, uh, but this is only about four hours of data in dark skies. So you can see how, if you can get out the dark skies or you can pay for dark skies, uh, how that greatly reduces the amount of time uh, to get the detail and resolution that you might be looking for. Um, but these images, all of them came originally from my backyard. Um, so it's uh, something you can definitely do. So 
that's it. Uh, it was, that's uh, kind of drinking from the fire hose, sped up a little bit there. Um, is there any questions or comments or anything anyone wanted to ask? Yeah, We've had a question. To... Oh, go ahead. I just want to say thank you for putting that data out there because that's been one problem I've always had is that <laughs> people always say, oh, use this software and this software, but they don't ever give you the data to do it yourself so that you can see, okay, what's the effect if I move the slider differently than they did? And why do they choose this set of, of parameters and stuff? So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, another nice thing uh, on top of the data, uh, I'm going to publish what I call the raw frames, which is the raw subs. And some of the neat things you can do is you can, uh, if you choose to frame the object, like how I did, you can take some of the, my data and then use that to calibrate your data from your backyard skies. So you can linear fit it, is what it's called, and then you can use that to help renew, uh, reduce the sky glow um, and actually improve your image processing. And I'm working on a detailed guide. So my hopes is uh, like uh, I can be kind of like uh, the the uh, star catalog of people that are backyard observers and you can, you can download the data if you don't have a telescope, but if you have a telescope, you can use it to supplement it. And, so it's like a uh, calibration frame for the light pollution to get it get rid of yeah. all of it. So in Pixit Insight, you can call what they call a linear fit, and you can say, here's my master that's really good, you know, from dark skies, but here's the one I have of the same uh, image area, but it's in my light polluted stuff. Um, it'll help remove that light pollution gradient without having to uh, go and do that yourself. So it's just, there's a whole bunch of cool uh, technique and things that people will be able to do as I release this stuff. So we, uh, we have a lot of great thanks and kudos to you, Byron, on a wonderful talk coming in on the uh, YouTube channel. Uh, we did have one question. Uh, are there any standards for cataloging the photos? There is. Um, I mentioned a couple of the websites. Um, uh, PixInsight has the uh, a tool so you can uh, solve it and pull the astrometry data into the image and you can use it to overlay kind of what uh, what you're seeing and what the objects are. Um, but if you upload to a, a, the actual astrometry.net, it'll plate solve and send you an image that shows you where it is. Um, and then there's some uh, free software that, it'll, that takes some of that output and then create local star catalogs and maps. Um, but I use, um, like, uh, I want to say uh, Starry Night Pro, I think, will let you download your images and then place them in your catalog, kind of like uh, Stellarium. Um, and then you can zoom in and see your images as you look through. Um, but the uh, Astrobin and then uh, Telescopius um, both let you upload your images, catalog them, and then you can save all of the metadata about them, like how many exposures, how long, what the temperature was. Um, and it'll keep track of all of that. Um, so you can see kind of where you started, um, uh, how it compares. Um, Telescopius goes a little bit further where you can upload an image and then you can say, well, I want to turn that into a mosaic and take pictures around it and make a bigger image um, than what your camera can see or uh, what your telescope can do individually. So you can take, uh, you know, 100 photos in one section, 100 photos in another section and do like a four panel mosaic and those tools will let you um, help uh, kind of put that together um, and then track all of, uh, all of your imaging runs. Um, some of the more complex, like SGP, I call it like the Excel of um, astro imaging. Um, it's uh, very familiar if you work in rows and columns, and, and a lot of them have, uh, uh, they'll track your images, they'll track what you've done, where you've been. Um, so it keeps like a local catalog of what you're working on uh, in that fashion. Okay, I'll throw out a question. Um, <clears throat> so you, you spent a lot of time talking about uh, trading money for photons and, and uh, time management and all of that, but it seems like the, the major investment uh, of the equipment is a kind of a fixed cost. And once you've got that, then if you consider your time as money, the major investment is, is uh, how much time you're spending here. Yeah. And I noticed you, you throughout you, you recommended automating as many things as you can so you can sleep at night. Yeah. Okay. So that's on, on the acquisition end. Uh, but I got a lot of friends that are into this and uh, it's a frequent thing I hear is they have data sets piling up on them 
And uh, you'll often hear, well, I finally got around to processing this thing I shot two years ago. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's definitely yeah. that. Um, so, you know, as uh, I kind of mentioned it earlier, we're kind of like in a renaissance of imaging. Um, so the cameras and all of that has really come down in price. And I mean, you can get like that ASI 543 used for around six or $700. I mean, it's still not cheap. Um, but for a very good camera that you'll be able to use and then sell for as much as you bought, that's the beauty of some of this for photography is the price does not fall out from under you. So it's not like a computer where it's lost cost. Um, so on that same line, there's the, you know, the modern um, like AMD and Intel, especially the Ryzen CPUs. So you can get like a 16 core CPU computer uh, at a very reasonable uh, cost. And you can use that uh, to brute force some of uh, the, the time that it normally would take. So, you know, CCD imagers, um, they chose to take fewer but longer subs so that it wouldn't take hours to do it computationally. Uh, me, uh, being a computer guy already, I'm like, well, I'll just uh, invest in a, a fairly modern computer and lots of RAM uh, and brute force it that way. Um, so I don't mind taking a lot more exposures. And to be honest, when you're in backyard astronomy in a light polluted sky, you're gonna have a lot more shorter photos. So if you wanna beat time, you're gonna have to, uh, I would say you're, you're gonna take as many photos as you can and as dark skies as you can, but you're gonna have a lot more cloudy days. So spend your computer time processing the data. Uh, you know, don't, uh, don't, uh, don't worry about that. You know, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's the trade-off. You want to spend as much time imaging as you can. Um, and then the compute time, you know, it might take a few hours for it to handle. Uh, you might have a back catalog of things you got to do. But there's a lot more days where the computer can run than clear skies currently. Okay, we've had another question come in from the YouTube chat. Uh, Byron, do you have any instructional videos on your website, especially when it processing there's a couple that i'm working <laughs> from um but honestly there's one guy that is uh, super amusing that does really good videos um uh and really small like uh 15 minute videos on specific areas of processing and imaging and all that his name is uh, quiv c-u-i-v the lazy geek um, and the, his youtube videos are awesome um he's a, a Super nice guy, super funny. He's a, a French guy that lives in Japan and he talks about imaging from his uh, apartment in Japan. So uh, it's uh, very, it runs parallel to very much difficulties of you know backyard imaging here in Austin with the, the humidity, the, uh, the cloudy skies or, uh, and then he's just a fun guy to listen to. Um, uh, I've, I've assisted him with some of his videos but I haven't quite gotten down the YouTube rabbit hole. Um, I technically learn better uh, reading because if I get on YouTube, I go down the, the sidebar recommended list and never, <laughs> you know, it's like the uh, rabbit hole that doesn't, uh, isn't conductive to learning for me, but uh, he's, he's awesome. <laughs> so not only so, you're uh, wondering how uh, giraffes do astrophotography. That's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, unfortunately, it's like, uh, uh, as we mentioned earlier, it's a, like, uh, doomsday astrology. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's not a good rabbit hole oftentimes. Uh, I don't know how that recommended it. You can even go in private. The recommendation on the right is kind of goofy at times. But uh, Quiv, C-U-I-V, the lazy geek, and uh, and he totally plays on the laziest way to do it, which is just, uh, you know, uh, a good, simple way of uh, getting started. So we've got one question on the uh, Zoom chat, or maybe a couple, but from Miles, uh, he's asking, uh, when he says, great presentation, Byron, any recommendation on filters for light pollution using DSLR? So the one that I've, uh, uh, there's, for DSLR, uh, there's two types of filters, really. There's, uh, when you when you connect a DSLR to your uh, telescope, you use a D-ring, and, and the D-ring will usually uh, screw on to your, reducer or if you don't have a reducer then uh, your camera to uh, your telescope camera tube essentially uh, a lot of times you can what i would recommend doing is putting a filter on your reducer um, that is a light pollution filter so that you're you're spending money on a filter that you could use if you replace the camera whereas a lot of times in dslr they sell these little clip-in filters that when you 
when you take your lens off your filter, you actually clip it in and then you screw that onto your D-ring um, and then onto your imaging train. Those ones uh, had been popular, but you could spend a couple hundred dollars on a clip-in filter. And then if you upgrade to a different camera, um, you gotta buy that filter all over again. So I recommend, uh, especially in our skies, the Optolong L Pro has been super awesome um, for a broadband type filter. It'll pick up narrowband targets, um, but it's a good light filter that doesn't turn everything a blue color. Um, it really uh, does an amazing job capturing dark nebulosity um, out of the sky glow here. Uh, I don't, uh, it seems almost magical at times. Um, so the L Pro, um, either in a 1.25, depending on how much your what size image you have, or the two inch. I typically just invested in two inch filters for the the buy once, cry once kind of thing. Uh, I didn't want to have to rebuy. Um, so the two inch L Pro, and then uh, for narrow band imaging, the two inch uh, Optolong uh, L Extreme or uh, L Enhance are great for a mission nebula, and those will work. Um, if you buy the two inch, they'll work with any color camera, any DSLR. Um, uh, if you move into mono, then you have to uh, purchase individual filters uh, and LRGB sets. So they're um, nice thing about the two inch filters is oftentimes telescopes come with reducers and things where you can thread them right in, um, so you don't have to worry about you know if you switch from Nikon to to Canon uh, buying a different clip in because of the different format they use. And I do, on my website, I do provide data so you can download the data and see, uh, uh, see what the L Pro data looks like compared to non L Pro. And uh, I'm getting ready to publish uh, some more tests on that. Um, and there's quite a few people, even on uh, uh, Cloudy Nights, that have uh, shared some of their stuff. Uh, it's kind of one of those topics where the old timers will tell you you're wasting money. Uh, but uh, I think anytime I can be imaging in the backyard instead of having to wait until I can drive out or camp somewhere um, is awesome. And that's why, you know, jokingly, uh, you know, moving towards automation is a big thing. You know, the focuser letting me sleep all night was a saving grace with the, <laughs> the wife and kids because I could just set up, get a polar line, let it go, and come inside and have a dream about what I would get in the morning, but at least I could be with the family. <laughs> uh, so, you know, uh, Anything that lets you uh, work towards uh, standard space stuff, I recommend. Hey, Byron, on your 120 millimeter refractor, are you using a, a field flattener in the train? I am. Um, the Spree is uh, nice because it comes with a 1.x field flattener. So if you want to run it at a, a, the full uh, 840 focal length, um, uh, it comes with a field flattener and it gives you a nice amount of bat back focus. Uh, I wanted to do a lot of wide fields, so I bought an Apex flat, uh, flattener reducer. That's a dot six five reducer. Um, it's a little bit smaller. It's a forty eight millimeter, which was a little bit bigger. Uh, but I actually uh, just got a message back from the vendor that Esprit will be selling a full frame capable reducer for their Esprit telescopes. Um, so I'm assuming it's going to be a sixty three or eighty three millimeter behemoth. Um, but you do want to run, um, you do want to run a, a, a flattener for sure. Um, it was one thing I, I kind of sped through a little bit. I wanted, a uh, good thing you brought that up, but I wanted to come back to it is one of the most difficult things, especially as you move into higher pixel and higher resolution and full frame is getting a flat field of view. Uh, the 1600, which is super popular mono, ASI 1600 and the ASI 533 are small. Um, small sensors, um, uh, you know, according to, uh, in, in comparison to like 35 millimeter full frame. That small sensor uh, is very forgiving with a lot of telescopes that aren't completely flat or don't have a really good field flattener or um, have a really bad uh, vignette or something where the light falls off outside the image circle. If you have a big camera and you have any of those problems, it just compounds them. And you really gotta, it's really just the amount of money you can throw at it and experimentation and trying to beat it or replacing that scope. So when, when I say uh, very forgiving, uh, those smaller sensors and smaller DSLRs are very forgiving that they can work uh, with some of the not terribly flat field optics. 
um, and they don't show curvature, they don't show um, uh, a tilt. Um, tilt is a huge thing where in a small camera, you wouldn't even know if your, fo uh, uh, your focuser had sag or um, there's a little bit of weight tilt in your, uh, your optics train. But if you move into a big sensor, the tilt can actually, uh, between the corners of your large 35 millimeter or larger frame, uh, actually shows up a star's blurring in those tilted directions. Um, and when you've spent that much money on a camera, you're, it's kind of infuriating that you got to go buy a new focuser, a new image train, or, uh, you know, it's, it's a rabbit hole of just endless uh, experimentation and uh, learning, which is kind of good when, you, when you've when you got the knowledge to know that kind of stuff, but to just get started out, you know, the, the 60 to 80 millimeter apos are just uh, super awesome and a small camera on the back isn't very heavy. A great way to learn, they're portable. Uh, you can take them down, put them away. They don't, you know, it's not like hauling around the 11 inch that weighs 60 pounds. Uh, so it's uh, very easy to get started with that. Okay then, anybody else with a question?